Good day, good people. You're listening to Lifting the Veil on our first broadcast over the American Freedom Radio Network. I'd like to thank Danny Romero and the good people at American Freedom Radio for asking me to join the family. It's an absolute honor, and I'm happy to be here. Now, today we have on the show um, Natasha Hines, author of Occult. But before we get to that, a little on my background. Uh, I've been, I started at uh, freethinkradio.com, then went off on my own with my editor, Justin, uh, where we did YouTube for a year, and now we're here. If you'd like to catch up and find out who I am, if you don't know, then please, by all means, go to liftingtheveil.ca and check me out. Until, uh, until then, enjoy the show. As I said, we've got Natasha Hines on the show today. Natasha, glad to have you with us. Hey. So how you? Going? Not too bad. I'm. Don't mind me if my voice goes. I'm suffering with this glandular thing right now, and my head and my head is like just absolutely wonky. How you feeling? But you think you think it sounds bad, but it sounds sexy. You, you don't have to apologize. Everybody <laughs> loves it. I've got the deep sultry thing going on right now. Exactly. <laughs> so uh, tell the listeners a little bit about yourself. Now I met you. Um, I th- earlier this year at Brantford in Canada at the uh, Mohawk um, Community yeah. Center. Yeah. But, uh, but you started off um, in the Occupy movement. We, we share a lot of similarities because um, we went, my family and I went and ventured to the Toronto Occupy. And a lot of the things that you came away with are very similar to the things that I came away with. So let's talk about, how did you get involved with Occupy? I was doing the internet thing for a while, like uh, same as everybody else, posting stuff on Facebook, watching the documentaries, you know, getting in the know about stuff. And um, Occupy, I think, I think that uh, a lot of people had the same idea of what Occupy meant or what it was supposed to change in the world kind of thing. And I was one of those people that thought that the Occupy movement was spawning from all this, this internet truth thing. And that this was going to be a revolution where the world was going to finally wake up and the 2012 thing where people were finally going to see the problems in the world and we're going to change everything and have a better world. And, and that was the idea going into it. And, uh, you know, uh, I, that's so funny because I felt the same kind of energy. It was like, wow, all these people from all these different walks of life are finally coming together to deal with the real problems. And then you walk into the camp. Let's talk about that a little <laughs> bit. <laughs> the camp, uh, there's there's different ways of looking at it. In one one way, it was somewhat of a microcosm of the society that we're living in, like living in a city, I'm, I'm speaking from the perspective of someone who lives in a city. So there was, you know, there was homeless people and there was hippies and there was all these different kinds of people living there, but there was, it was like living in the crack park of the city kind of thing. Like we, we attracted a lot of, uh, it, it was, it was like a soup kitchen slash hippie fest slash where all the drug dealers pop tents. <laughs> oh, it's <laughs> just it's just so sad that unfortunately it did attract a lot of stuff like that. I, I noticed in, in the book that you were talking about the people that were like um, into the whole, what we like to call love and light area of things. And yeah. uh, they thought that they could just sit and manifest food when it took, you know, people to <laughs> actually bring food. And it's funny because I kind of consider myself some sort of, I don't know if you want to say hippie because I have hippie tendencies and I have tendencies that kind of go all over the place. But like when we went to Occupy, I brought a huge mass of lasagna and bread and all this stuff. I made like tons of rice and I, I mean, that's what they needed. They needed food. We bought cases of water. We did whatever we could to kind of help. And uh, I saw that a lot of people weren't doing that. It was nice to see the, like, the homeless people I saw coming in. I was really, I mean, it was good for my children, I think, to see the, the true state of the world. Yeah. And when you say, like, you know, that it's like kind of a microcosm of the, the bigger picture it is, because if you look at it, it was like this grand chaos 
with mm. you, with all these different sects of everybody coming in and trying so hard to to find some kind of peace within but there was like it almost felt like there was this energy that was making everybody separate no matter what Absolutely. you had the communists over here beside the socialists over there and the the mohawk warriors over here and the new agers over there and nobody really had any sense of direction that's a that's a very good point because going into it you know a lot of people had this the state of mind and my, myself too i have a lot of hippie tendencies and i don't mean hippie as a negative thing but um it's there was a lot of people going into it with this perception that you know love is the answer and we're all going to get along and we're going to build this example for the rest of the world where we're all going to get along and all kinds of different people from different areas but it, I, there was a lot of elements on the camp itself that uh didn't allow for that and also human nature in itself like we'll get into that but there, there's a lot of stuff that we have to fix inside our own minds and inside our own uh, emotional state to be able to get to that point we were kind of naive walking into that thinking that we were suddenly going to change the world just by with the anticipation of being able to love each other like that, because that's exactly what happened was all these different people with different beliefs got into the same room and then fight started. And, uh, people had this, I'm right, you're wrong thing. And it, we lost sight of the original goal, but I don't, I don't think, I think it was, a lot of elements of having an outdoor campsite in the middle of a city surrounded by cops and traffic and, and alcohol and all this stuff that were elements that played into this that made people angry and made people defensive and made people separate and forget why they were there for the love of it and ended up fighting for their beliefs because we all know in a base core of ourselves that we all want to get along. We want to love each other. We all want to have peace. We all want to have food. We want to have water. We all want to have our needs met. Yeah. So, you know, we were cold, we were tired and all these other elements that played into the fact that we didn't want to get along. And you have people with very strong political views and to the point where it's just like religious views. If you go to a Christian, like a hardcore Christian, and you tell them that you're an atheist, what do you think is going to happen? That you're going to both love each other, give each other a hug, and you're going to get along? No, you're probably going to have start off with a philosophical debate, and it's going to end up in an argument. Yeah, unfortunately, that's so true. It's so true. But now, like you started it right at a, right in at the ground level, and you were actually involved in the uh, in the in the in behind the scenes. What what was going on there? Like, were you 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 say you weren't there from like day one, the first meeting, which turned out to be like an absolute redonkulous situation because you did, everybody had this different way of communicating. Can you get into that a little bit? The the very first meeting I wasn't there. The very second meeting, I was there, and from that point on, I was one of the main organizers. Just because I'm. Uh, hyperactive <laughs> I need mm -hmm. to do things so I got very involved and um, they it's like we walked in and essentially people don't want to take command like a, the whole um, you know no leaders thing kind of it was to the point where nobody was even managing anything it's not it's not it wasn't about people had this idea of managing was equivalent to a leader and so nobody told anybody what to do and if somebody told somebody what to do even if it was just to organize something they would either get defensive or they could get mad and you can't tell me what to do and it's like well you can't just have you're trying to build a wall okay somebody has to say listen this is the brick we're going to use this is the grout we're going to use there's we're going to put the wall you're going to start on that side and you're going to start on that side it's called management and in this situation, nobody was allowed to tell anybody else what to do. So the wall was part brick, part marble, part rocks, part over there, part over there with a big hole in the middle. And that's, I guess, my analogy for how the meetings were working. And uh, so our, we had um, the vocabulary. It's been so long. The vocabulary is escaping me. But uh, a facilitator would go up and was facilitating without trying to be a leader. So they're trying to allow the crowd to decide things, but they're not actually, they, they, the second meeting, they didn't know what they were doing. So they're trying to get people to 
be functional without telling them to be functional and without controlling the crowd in any way, shape, or form. So what's going to happen? You have a crowd of people. Nobody is doing any kind of control of whatsoever. Everybody's walking in different directions. Everybody's raising their hand. And it was just a mess. And to the point where people, we, it was all very obvious amongst the crowd that we all just wanted to start doing something instead of st- sitting in a circle and everybody got kept voting on whether or not we were going to do something. Should we vote again or should we do something? And we'd vote, let's do something. Okay, so are we going to do something, you know, uh, here? Are we going to do something there? Should we do the, should we go in that corner or should we go in this corner? You want to sit on that side or do, should it's we so do the list funny. first? And it's... we're voting on every little thing. It's total micromanagement mess, just Chaos. a mess. You know, it's funny because isn't it the perfect way to show the world that it, by by twisting it, that we're not ready to take care of ourselves. If you're leaderless, there's chaos, when in reality it's just a matter of people taking responsibility for situations and trying to come to some kind of agreement to work with each other, the idea of coexisting. And it almost, it like I mean, it truly seems like it's co-opted to just show that, well, obviously the world isn't ready for this because look at what happened. Yeah, well, exactly. And in a way... Maybe it's not, and in a way, maybe that was one of the functions of the Occupy movement to turn it into a disaster, just to prove to people, you know. But there's there's different ways to look at that. But a leader is not. There's a difference between a leader and a dictator. We need leaders. Leaders are inspirational people who motivate, who organize things, who take, uh, uh, you know, who are responsible for things, who take initiative. A dictator is what we need to stop. A dictator is someone who takes away our rights and tells us what to do, even though it's not the right thing, who organizes things in a way where the poor people suffer and the rich get richer. So we have to get our vocabulary straight or at least our definitions. I, I, I can't agree with you anymore on that point. We, uh, we've we taken everything to a whole new level and we think that you know leaders, they really do exist. They're people that get the job done. And that they're, they're, they put themselves out there to get the job done. And and a lot of the time that's looked down upon now because we don't know which end is up anymore um, to some extent, especially when we get together in these big groups. Although I do see that there's a lot of wonderful little side communities that are being started everywhere that are doing really well because I think they everybody's kind of learned from the Occupy movement and, and other situations, other movements um, that are going on that, you know, you've got to, I, I think all these little movements are m- making the way for something greater because we're learning from the mistakes. Now, what would you say, what was your position? What did you hold? Uh, what was your role in, in Occupy Montreal? A little bit of a lot of things. It was, it was... I, looking back, it was definitely as much as we tried to avoid the whole leader thing and this and that, it definitely ended up with leaders and it definitely ended up with hubs of control. And that's kind of, it stemmed from, and not, not necessarily in a negative way, but it stemmed from the committees because the committees were the ones making decisions for certain things. And yes, they had to answer to the general assembly, but the general assembly was a whole nother mess. Every time the General Assembly would vote on something, sorry, <laughs> they were doing that whole micromanaging thing where it would take them like 17 hours to decide what they were going to put in their Subway sandwich or whatever, and nothing would ever get done. Or the committees would just be like, whatever, we're just going to do it this way. You know, a small group of people who just got together and like, listen, this is obviously going to work. I'm not wait- waiting 17 hours for them to decide like the next three three steps when we can do 14 steps in the next half hour. So the the committee people did a lot of quote unquote controlling because they were actually doing the work. And the General Assembly people were doing a lot of voting and no work and then complaining that the committees were taking too much control. So it was just this weird, ugh, just... Just a big, big circular, circular cyclone of absolute nonsense where everybody's got all these ideas and positions and nobody's doing anything about it. That's it. And that's one of the biggest flaws, I think, not only in the movement, but in society in itself, is that 
with voting and the political system and, and the protesting, this is why since Occupy, I do not protest and I do not advocate protesting. Not that I think that people shouldn't protest. Like if you protest, it's wrong and you go home, but just that I don't think it's going to accomplish anything because of what I've experienced. Cause what I learned was very simply, if we want things to change, we need to take initiative and make them change. Somebody has to do it. So you can complain all you want. I, I feel like protesting a lot of the time is giving away your power. It's telling other people that they are responsible for fixing it and just complaining about it and then waiting for them to finally give in to the fact that you're really upset about it. And then hopefully they'll do what you asked, or you may, maybe you're not going to vote for them the next time, but we all know that's useless. That's a useless threat. Yeah. So <laughs> if you want change, you have to go make it happen. If you want food, you have to go find the food, cook the food, serve the food, whatever. If you want change in the political system, you need to go and make that happen. You need to get up, make a plan and initiate that plan and go through the steps and go get other people on board and just do what you want to happen. Exactly. Not just wait for other people to fix it for you. No, for sure. Now with that, we are moving on to our first break. You're listening to the first broadcast on AFR Radio, American Freedom Radio, of Lifting the Veil with Carrie Lee, and today with Natasha Hines. Welcome back to Lifting the Veil. I am Carrie Lee, and uh, we're here on our first show on American Freedom Radio with Natasha Hines, author of OccuCult, and friend. Now, Natasha, before the break, we were talking about, you know, the a lot of the sinister side to Occupy, and I want the listeners to know that it's not all that. Listen to the whole show, because we're going to cover absolutely every angle you can think of. Of course, um, you know, things are not always as they seem. We know this. We live in a society where one hand's doing one thing while the other hand's distracting you while it does it. So um, it shouldn't be any surprise that there's some scars on this Occupy movement. No matter how much good it's done, you know, there's balance. So with that being said, let's continue. Natasha, how you doing? I'm good. How are you? I'm not doing too bad considering I sprayed this awesome herbal throat spray. I, I'm going to have to get the name of it and maybe I'll put it in the comments when I throw this on YouTube. I get just to throw it on YouTube, but um, it sprays the inside of your throat. It's kind of rank, but it does the trick. So I'm not it's doing too rank. bad. That's a good selling point. It really, honestly, <laughs> I cannot tell a lie. It is kind of rank, but it does the job. So what are you going to do? Um, Within the Occupy movement, um, you, you, we talked about like inside the camp. Let's talk about the good that came out of inside the camp now. Um, what did you see as like the, the really beneficial things? Because like, I mean, when um, I guess to start us off, I'll say that, you know, when I went there, I saw people actually trying. And yeah. I saw that, uh, you know, it was this atmosphere of, all right, now, uh, you know, People now smile on your brother. Everybody get together. That's what it was uh, in a big way. I saw some, you know, I saw my deceptions. Let's let. I'm going to talk about my my story. I my husband. This woman walked up to my husband, and and it's funny how they do things. It's kind of like Mormons, you know, how they walk around. They're 18 <laughs> year old beauties walking around, knocking on doors, saying, "Come be one of us." But you know, they sent a girl to a boy. Which, I'm not jealous, it's not about that, it's just the dynamics of it. Okay, send a girl to a boy who's wearing something that promotes um, indigenous awareness, Indian awareness, native awareness, however you want to say it. And she says, you know, I'd like you to do this for us. And he says, well, you know, um, you should really talk to my wife because that's more her her forte. I kind of just like to sit in the background, which when he does shine, boy, does he sparkle well. But that being said, so I go and I do this job, whereas go get all these names for all these elders so that we can do a sacred fire. I had the job done in five minutes, and I wasted 
two hours trying to find the girl to get the job complete. So it, I found that people would send you on tasks, and I'd heard this from other people, where you would get a task done and then it, it couldn't get to the next level so that something could actually get done. She was also the liaison to the police. So, I mean, that being said, I should have known when I walked into the situation that she was really there That to help. makes so much sense. Right? Like, I mean, but like this is hindsight. When at the time I was like, yeah, let's do this. I wasn't thinking that there was an ulterior, ulterior exactly. motive. In the, in the moment, you, you think that everybody wants the same thing and... You think that, you know, all kinds of stuff. You're like, no, this person couldn't be, like, trying to sabotage what we're doing because they're one of us and, you know, they're out here in the cold. And, of course, we're just doing this because we want a better world and who would ever want to sabotage this and all this stuff. And you just want to get the job done. And in hindsight, you're like, oh, my God. We found out that Sacred Fire didn't happen for another three or four days. Honestly, I had all the names. I had all the contacts. It was done. Done deal. All we had to do was do it, you know? And and yep. instead, and then when you find out, well, it was the liaison to the police trying to make, well, really, you're going to take four days to do that? That's disrespectful. Very, very disrespectful. But okay, my, all my judgments aside, let's get to the good stuff, because yeah, I just brought us back down to a negative. No, well, yeah, well, I was thinking that too. I don't want this to be like this one big gray cloud interview, like, that sucks yeah. and this sucks too. <laughs> no, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Talk about some good stuff too. Balance. It wasn't all bad. It's just that, yeah. In, in hindsight, yeah, totally. I realized a lot of stuff that happened, and us too. And I think I think that a lot of occupiers have the same experience with certain positions. Were I? I mean, I have no evidence to say that anybody was placed there, but I do know that there was a couple of suspicious people that came in and they took over key committees, such as the liaison for the police and the finance committee. And these are committees that are not only key committees that make or break the survival of the camp and the flourishment of the camp, but there was no problem with them before they came in. And then they came in and they caused the problems. Yeah, that makes so so much sense. Yeah, looking back, it's very interesting. So positive, positivity. Well, you know, we did, I know myself, I met a lot of fantastic people. And, uh, and, and I was given like that energy boost of why we're doing it, why I do what I do as, as an alternative or alternative media representative. Um, I think that, uh, it's, it's been a fantastic ride that, that we're going through from 2009 to, to now I've seen things just change exponentially. And so to see everybody gather like that, I was very proud of us as, as mankind. You know, I think I think it started something that was really that was really good. And in those times, we got to spread good information. And it's just it was that seed planting time kind of type. Yeah, thing. I really appreciated seeing um, the the homeless people that were there that put in so much effort. You could tell that they really cared. They really wanted to be there. You know, they were happy to be there. They were, they had food and it was, it was a cool little village. It was, there was times when it was so beautiful. Like I will never forget experiencing that. And it it was definitely something worth experiencing for sure. It was beautiful at times. It was just, you know, had a, had a sad demise and possibly a sad purpose beyond what the people wanted from it. That makes any sense. Yeah, no, so the people aside, you know, who all walked in with fantastic intentions, what did you, how, how was the reaction from the city and then the reaction coming from inside Occupy after the city got involved? Uh, the, the mayor is a giant hypocrite, first of all. He, uh, sorry, Go figure, you know, eh? hear that. there's like people racing outside my window this <laughs> So the, um, the mayor, I'm trying to remember all the drama, but I, he would do, he would tell us one thing and then he would tell the papers another thing. And, you know, he, it was just, it was obviously, he was just doing whatever the, the people, like being a politician, kind of thing. He being was being a politician, a politician. That's placating, exactly what it was. placating and everybody. We were being, exactly. And we were being, um, you know, we were falling apart from the inside. So that's why. I'm pretty sure that it was it was relatively 
well planned in terms of how to take us down without d- demolishing his reputation because um, people were like people, the general population that didn't show up to the, the camp, they seemed pretty um, supportive of it. A lot of people were, especially the press, they were very supportive of it. You know, they saw that there was homeless people there that were getting fed and, and people that like there wasn't, it wasn't, they, they saw the beauty in it and they were happy that people were standing up for society and trying to make a difference. Yeah, you know, as something that comes to mind right now is the what just happened recently in Toronto. I'm sure you read that they destroyed the uh, the garden that they had outside of was it City Hall. They had an organic garden, and the day before the harvest, the police came in and destroyed everything. Which city is this? In Toronto. Oh boy. And it was like you know everybody had put into this, and that was like oh, another. That's yeah, like a, a non. Uh, I do remember hearing about that. I, I would like a non, I would think a non co opted effort, like just saying, you know what, you've got all this yard, we're going to plant a garden right here. They let it go the entire summer. It brought the community together. And, and then the police came in and went, oh, well, no, we're just going to trash all this and throw it in the garbage, knowing that the, the harvest was the next day. Um, I think that sent a pretty hostile message out. And this is still, from what I understand, still part of the Occupy movement that's lingering on today. What's lingering on in the Ocup- within the Occupy movement in the Montreal area? Well, we had the student protest, which <laughs> yes. was Yes, massive. you did. <laughs> yes, you did. You want to talk about that a little bit? Uh, I do, because it led to our separatist uh, premier being voted in. So yay, go student protest. <laughs> like, okay. The, the energy was still there for, from Occupy, but like the winter basically killed the protesting. So there was still some hardcore occupiers, you know, doing their thing in a loft or whatever, but most of the people who were showing up uh, every weekend, we had thousands of people. So most of those people, they were like hibernating, you know, they're, they're like, no, it's winter. No. No, I'm not doing it. But as soon as springtime came and all this protesting spawned for the, 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 the student tuition thing, and all the students were out in the row in the streets like every single day protesting, thousands of them. Um, but if after I did all this research, like trying to figure out what happened in, in hindsight with Occupy and war, were we being manipulated and was this planned and this kind of thing, I started noticing things that I didn't notice before. Like in the pictures, there was, everybody was wearing the same color and they had like balloons with logos on them. I think it, I'm pretty sure it was CSN, the, the, um, the union, the work union or something that was okay. sponsoring them. Cause I remember that they wanted to get involved financially and Occupy from the beginning. So all the the protesters are all wearing matching clothes. They're all wearing the red, red shirts with the red banner and the red balloons with logos on them. And I'm like, okay, that's not very organic. That yeah. kind of seems pretty mechanical, like somebody planned a publicity stunt of some sort. And sure. there's obviously money going into it. So what is going on here? Who's like pulling the strings? And then as it goes on, you start seeing these politicians jumping on the platform, like uh, with Pauline Marois, who is the separatist premier of, of Quebec, who I guess I'm going to use a light word, dislikes all English people and wants Quebec to be its independent country and all the people born here get their own passport and all the English people can go away. <laughs> all this wow. Stuff. Anyways, yeah. It's yeah. like, it's really, it's, there's a lot of tension in Quebec between Anglophones and Francophones in that, in that separatist area or whatever. Mm-hmm. And, and she's the epitome of it because she doesn't like us. So she's, oh, I love the students. And oh, if you vote for me, I will make sure that what you want happens. So it's they like, come okay. in, they can, they come in these sneaky snake politicians and the people just lap it up. That's exactly it. So everybody's like, yeah, Pauline's on our side. She's awesome. Plus, we hate Shara anyways. Oh, everybody's just so desperate that they they, they grab onto this. I remember being this way. I can remember being this way where you sit back and you go, yeah, they're going to make a difference. And yeah, but I mean, how many times can you get let down? 
if if there's anybody out there that's still voting, please take a look at what you're doing. And please take a look at the fact that you've got, you know, two, two wings on the same bird. It doesn't matter. That's exactly it. I, I used to be like that as well. I used to have this optimistic view of you see the new guy come in and say all these promising things and you think you're so hopeful and you're like, I'm going to vote for them and they're going to be great. I'm going to vote for Obama because he's amazing. Well, I'm not American, but you know what I mean? <laughs> the same idea. And yeah. so they come in and they, they tell you one thing that you really like, like, you know, the in the States, it's like the gay rights and stuff like that. It's like, Okay, you say one thing that we really like, so we should vote for you and ignore everything else because that's our only option. We have crappy option A or crappy option B. Which one do you want? Instead of taking the time to stop and think, okay, they're both crappy. This one's going to bow on it, but they're both crappy. Why don't I try to, why don't we all come together and actually get someone who's not crappy and get them into power instead of just taking the easy way out and voting for whatever your crappiest, the crappy, less crappy option is. Well, okay, so now like, we have a separatist I, premier. I get scared about that because, like, even the crappiest of the crappy are still going to be crap. Yeah, exactly. It's and exactly. we're using such amazing potty language to get our thoughts across right now. You, you all must be so, so happy that you tuned in today. As we talk about bad, the cream of the crop. That's not a bad radio word. <laughs> the C word is not a bad radio word. But uh, but no, it's true. It's it's the. Um, is there a different way to view? Is there? Will there ever be a different way to do poli- politics? Or is it just a matter of running around like without any kind of guidance? Because I mean, the idea of what government is, as opposed to the idea of what government, you know, is supposed to be. It's it. What's the point? What what I I just don't I don't even know what to say on it anymore. Well, this is this is the thing is that all these good-hearted people think they believe that their option is to vote. It's the perception is wrong. The perception is these candidates show up out of nowhere, hypothetically, and you we believe that these are our only options. So we vote for what we believe is our only options. So always the lesser of two evils, regardless of the fact that it's evil. But why do we believe that they're the only options? Because the people who are saying that I'm your only option, those three to five candidates, whatever, are not good hearted, most of them. And they understand what it is to manipulate people and take advantage of situations. And they know, they understand how to tell you what you want to hear. And yeah. you believe what they tell you. Sweet little secrets whispered into our ears. And once again, we're coming to our next break. Uh, again, you're listening to Lifting the Veil with uh, myself, Carrie Lee, and our guest today, Natasha Hines, author of A Cult Cult. And you can find that on Amazon. And uh, we'll be back very, very, very soon on AmericanFreedomRadio.com. that the truth you will not fool the children of the revolution welcome back to lifting the veil again i'm your host carrie lee on my first broadcast on american freedom radio i'd like to give a shout out to my dad and like get totally personal right now he's uh he's got um kidney failure going on earlier this year he had uh, a stroke and an aneurysm and a heart attack like all at once and he was pretty bad off and his kidneys were going into failure and then he got them back up and now they failed again and a lot of it all of it has to do with big pharma and big pharma's killing most of our my generation's parents as far as i'm concerned and uh and he's trying really hard right now to, I'll, I have so many friends who have given me um, links for raw food diets and different herbal remedies that are out there. 
uh, of all kinds. To everybody that's been sending me love and my father healing, thank you so much. Uh, this this cold that I suffer right now is is a product of my own inner disease. So thank you for bearing with my my brain, which is completely off right now. And uh, and hopefully you'll turn in next week when I will have author and uh, uh, I'm sorry, um, author, energy worker, visionary artist and musician Martin W. Ball, his latest book being Human an entheog I can never say this word, so it has nothing to do with me being sick. Entheological Guide to God Evolution and the Fractal Energetic Nature of Reality. And uh and, and, and yeah, that's where I am in my brain, just drew a blank again. So on with the show. So Natasha, um, what are your thoughts on Big Pharma and all that madness? I hate them. Yeah, I know, right? <laughs> Is that a good answer? You know, I totally agree with the, lo- the raw food thing. It's definitely, you know, don't turn to drugs, turn to, turn to the earth. Well, this is the thing. They put him on a steroid, and and he just got worse and worse and worse. And I tried to tell him, you know, Dad, you got to get off all this stuff. You got to do a kidney flush, and you've got to do this, that, and the other. And it's it's hard. I mean, he's been, and and I I'm giving him excuses right now, and so be it. Um, he's been on big pharma meds since he was like 20. He had a near death experience. He was pronounced dead at the scene of a of a car wreck, and uh, you know he's been on progressive medications, codeine, morphine, uh, oxycodone, what is it, uh, oxycontin, um, all these different things, and it's finally taken its toll. And from what I understand, I was talking with a recent Vinnie Eastwood guest, Angela Foreman. She was talking to a nurse the other day who said, you know, as they get older, as people get older, they can't dispel the synthetic from their body anymore. And... um, that's something that I can see happening. My dad's really suffering right now. The medication is not doing him any good. Uh, he needs a, tr- a kidney transplant, and yet everybody's saying, no, 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 he can rejuvenate his lungs, or his, I'm sorry, his kidneys. So that's what he's working towards. And I'm, I'm, it's hard for him, though. I can, I can hear it in his voice. I think there's that fear when the, the medication becomes some kind of twisted friend, and it's a very hard bond to break. Well, that's it. Even if you want to... You, part of you knows that obviously the chemicals that you're putting into your body versus the natural remedies, you know, part of you knows that you shouldn't be putting the chemicals into your body, but the other part of you trusts the hype and trust because you're so desperate to get some sort of a cure that you, you end up trusting the doctors and the pharmaceutical companies because they're so confident that their product is the only answer, even though if you look at the statistics, it doesn't really work with what they're saying, you know, yeah, but no. you're desperate for, to trust in something. That's exactly it. Exactly. Instead of trusting in yourself and like nature, That's we have it. everything that we need here to heal us uh, within ourselves uh, mostly. But like when you're putting constant toxins in your body, you have to flush. And, and, uh, you know, I've said, you know, you can take, 20 years off your life, 10, 20 years off your life, if you just eat properly, put, consume good, wholesome foods. Um, I'm not, I don't always eat well. I totally cheat once in a while, but I eat more good than I don't. And, and you can tell, you can tell. So, you know, let's, uh, let's hope that people get off of the, I, and I mean, I, I want, I have all this hope in the world that my father is going to survive, but in, in the end, it is completely up to him. Um, transplants are incredibly dangerous, and uh, I've been looking into them because the first thing I thought was, oh, I'm going to give him my kidney. Oh, my goodness. Like, some of the horror stories that I've heard, and, and I thought my first reaction was, ouch, this is going to leave a hole in my body where, you know, I'm supposed to have this. You're created a certain way for a reason. I'm not saying that kidney donors shouldn't donate. I'm not saying organ donors shouldn't donate. That's not, it's my own personal choice. And, and, you know, some people have said, you know, that's a very selfish choice that you've come to. And I just don't think it to be so. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's a tough place. Let's talk about Occupy now. Less about what, you know, my foibles are and things. And let's talk about uh, the Occult book. How long did it take you to write it? 
uh, to write it maybe a couple weeks, and then I had to rewrite it several times. And that took like two months and editing yeah. and stuff like that. The editing the writing, process. Terrible. Yeah, the writing part of it is is not that difficult if you're inspired. It's getting it to the point where it's you know readable by other people, kind of thing. Like I used, I had took out chapters that were just like these long rants, and I'm like, this is inappropriate. This has to be removed. <laughs> Nobody can see this ever. That's good. No, that's good that at least you had the sense to not want to put stuff out there that just you know generally didn't need to be out there because some stuff is just not necessary and is just like background noise that people grab onto for gossipy bits right that's it and trying to keep it as much uh like i don't want to tell people what to think i just want to provide them with enough information that they can come to their own conclusions you know uh, yeah I mean? from your experience now what was your greatest source of inspiration to actually write the book like what was your oh my what was that you know when explain that, that moment moment that click moment was uh, one day while we were watching the General Assembly on live stream and in, in the loft. This is after the cl- camp had been closed down and we were trying, some of us are trying desperately to fix the problems. Like we could tell that there was major problems and we were trying to fix it. But like you said, there were some people who were sabotaging all the, all the progress And it got to the point where it's like, well, what is the point of wasting all this time and energy trying to to fix things when these people, these core people who are always at the General Assembly who are really involved, who are constantly sabotaging this. And from the way that the people at the General Assembly were acting at this point, I'm like, you know what? I just turned to my friend. I'm like, you know what? This is like a cult. And I'm like, you know what? This is so ridiculous. What we're watching and what we're doing is so ridiculous. Ridiculous that like people yelling at each other and arguing and we're trolling on the internet and people uh, like booing other people for having a different opinion. And it was so ridiculous that I'm like, I swear I should write a book about this and I'm going to call it OccuCult and it's going to be hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> So, it is a good like, read. It is a very good read. I suggest oh, everybody yeah. read it because, you know, you can't really make an opinion on anything unless you do read it. What what kind of uh, feedback have you been getting? Actually, you know what? I think I'll save that. Um, the idea that we are uh, so judgmental of other people's views and, uh, and, and I mean, even I, I'm, I'm guilty of it myself. Sometimes I, I, I judge without thinking, but you've encountered a lot of different, uh, uh, different emails from all kinds of people that have a lot of really, really harsh words for you without even taking a look at what it is that you're saying. That's something that we're going to get into after the break. Uh, once again, we are joined by Natasha Hines author of OccuCult, and um, you're listening to Lifting the Veil with Carrie Lee on AmericanFreedomRadio.com. No fear of doom. No fear of doom. We are. We are. American Freedom Radio. American Freedom Radio. Welcome back to Lifting the Veil. I'm your host, Carrie Lee, on our first broadcast on AmericanFreedomRadio.com. Um, again, my guest is Natasha Hines, author of the book OccuCult. Before the break, we were talking about the feedback that you've been getting from, list- uh, from readers uh, or non-readers that are just on the attack. Let's talk about that a bit. Well, there's mainly three different kinds of feedback. Well, four if you count, you know, my friends who are like, this is awesome. But uh, there's the people who weren't interested in Occupy in the first place, who weren't interested in my book, (laughs) obviously. Then there was the people who went through this and they're like, 
oh my God, that's exactly what I went through. I totally get it. And they supported what I was doing. And then there was the haters, like uber trolling bully haters who didn't even have any clue what my book was about besides some like shock and awe trailer that I did, like some very vague trailer that I did for the book. And so instead of reading the preface that is free on the internet or going to get the dollar, the the book for a dollar, it's a dollar. On Kindle, yeah. (laughs) You know what I mean? And you can all share it amongst yourselves. You can all put in a penny and then share it with with each other. Yeah. Or you just... You know, like there was so many ways they could just read the book even for free. And they, instead of reading the book, not even the preface, I don't even think most of them read the about part of my, my Facebook page. They, they're they like, you're a horrible person. How can you say that? And they were telling everybody that what I said wasn't true and telling them that I'm lying and telling this complete hating. I had like messages on my, uh, on my blog, like comments and, and stuff that were like, you know, F you and F this and F oh, yeah, that. Yeah, because people usually don't use any type of couth when they're going to respond to something that they're vehemently trying to defend. But the funny thing is, is that as you're trying to just say, like, listen, I put my heart and soul, and like, I mean, if you read the book, I put my heart and soul into Occupy, and when I sat back afterwards and looked at everything, this is what I realized, and it, it it's, it's disturbing to me. So I'm putting it out there for everybody. And, you know, that's the time where people would read it and then, you know, draw their own conclusions from it. Instead, they make like you the guy that's against Occupy instead of realizing that there is a whole mission to destroy Occupy from within. Exactly. That's exactly it. So you're just a scapegoat. Exactly. And then there was some people from Occupy, some of the people that were attacking me at first, afterwards they you know either read the preface or something happened and they're like wait a minute and they came back to me and they're like you know what you're actually right you know that that does make a lot of sense like i'm really sorry kind of thing i had quite a few of those that's so, good that's good because it yeah. shows that you know there are those people out there that were willing to take the tra- the chance to to you know look at the situation from the other side of the mirror kind of type thing yeah i, I mean the I guess what I learned from this is that when you have a different opinion than other people, like you, you're going to get attacked. (laughs) You know what I mean? Yeah, for sure. Same thing for truthers and stuff like that. People who disagree with you will try everything that they can to make you feel bad about having a different opinion so that you just conform to the status quo like that is how society runs why do you think we repeat the same mistakes over and over and over again because that one person that sticks their head out and goes wait a minute what if we do it this way because i don't think this is working for us they get their head chopped off so it's it's scary to be that person who goes out first and says i disagree i think this because it's painful to have that feedback from from the crowd so a lot of people conform go against their own beliefs and instincts and conform just to not get that that hate all laid out on them because it's just easier to conform just to not have to go through it's very hard to be the messenger I mean I went through it a couple times this summer and well once this summer and once this fall where I delivered a couple you know things that I discovered that weren't taken too well in a couple groups and, you know, you have to just detach yourself from it. It's not yours. It's just the information. If you're true and your intention is good, it's just about relaying the information. And whatever comes back is, you know, it's the parable is, you know, if something good happens, you can't, or is it bad? Who's to say what's good or bad? It just is. Yeah. You know, um, I want to thank you very much for sharing your story about uh, Occupy here and, and I would like you to tell the listeners where they can get your book. Uh, it's on Amazon. It's a dollar. <laughs> <laughs> um, and like the PDF version, like the Kindle version is a dollar. And the, if you get the paperback, it's like nine ninety nine or something. And uh, if you have Amazon, there's like a, an Amazon, I think it's left or something. It's like the Amazon library 
it's in the library for like another month or something. So you can get it for free if you have the Amazon library thing. Awesome. Awesome. Now there's, you've done a lot of things. Let's talk about the other work that you've done. Let people know who you are outside of the Occupy territory. Outside, like far outside? No, well, just the other <laughs> the, the other things that you've got your hands dabbled into because, you know, you're, you're a multifaceted woman that's out there doing many things. You're not just, it's not just, you know, one side of the coin. You've done a lot more than Occupy. I met you at, uh, like I said, the Mohawk Kanata Center. And, um, you know, you were doing thing, uh, things as far as uh, helping the Mohawks uh, try and figure out what to do next with the um, residential school situation that is being worked towards right now. Um, what are the other things that you've got your hands dabbled into? Uh, are we getting into the decolonization thing right now? <laughs> sure, if you want to, but like well, just... Because they're if, like so far apart, I could go in a completely different direction. You, go this. wherever you <laughs> want. No, you can go. You can go wherever you want. I don't segue. I'm just talking. <laughs> I am so weird that you can't put me in a box, put it that way. So that's a loaded question i'm a musician and i uh i'm a writer and i have a blog and i'm making youtube videos and trying to get like a channel going and i like to do a lot of artsy stuff um i'm a producer like i when i say i'm a musician i'm like in the studio like i write and i produce and i sing and whatever so like I'm very involved in a lot of artsy stuff and very uh, internet entrepreneurial stuff so that I can be creative and create things of value and that kind of thing. And Excellent. on the side. Uh, and where can we find some of your work, like as far as your music goes and whatnot? I have a website. I have my .com website, natashahines.com, H-Y-N-E-S. Um but uh, I do a lot of blogging too. So, which you there's a blog button on my website, but there's also you just go to WordPress, my WordPress blog. So it's uh, natashahines.wordpress.com, which is my uh, pretty active blog, other than the last couple of weeks because my life is in shambles. But, uh, <laughs> I think we're all going through that. I don't know if anybody out there is like going there's just madness going on everybody and everywhere don't worry about it it's okay we're all kind of going through it I've noticed right now try really hard to just coast through if you can it's not easy I know I'm with you um now yeah let's let's move on to decolonize explain to the people what decolonize is okay in a nutshell you might have to help me out with this so decolonizing mm -hmm. is essentially okay for anybody who doesn't know because they believe that the TV tells them everything that's true and all this other stuff is that um, the natives were here first. Okay. Surprising. <laughs> big shock. <laughs> and they didn't just, and they didn't just say, here you go, take all the land yes. and, and, and rape it and take yes. away the, you know, the veins out of her blood and, and cut down all of her trees. No, no, no. That wasn't the deal. Yeah. And there wasn't only a couple hundred of them and there wasn't only a few reserves and it was packed full of Indians and, uh, and they, they all got here. killed. There was this massive then, genocide and then they exactly. colonized Canada. Exactly. So white man comes in, just goes, does their thing. Yeah, we're going to clear off this land, right? Yeah, because but, we have to tame the savages. Let's not forget that bit. Of course, exactly. Anything that's different, we should fear it and we should kill it because it's a threat to us and we want to control everything. So we're going to kill everything and everybody and et cetera, et cetera. And I, for the record, I'm white, so I'm allowed to say racist things against white people. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so anyways. Uh, it's yeah, not racist so if it's true. Yeah, exactly. So decolonize is working towards giving Taking land back. right back, rights back to the people who it belongs to. And uh, so I had these people come up to me. I mean, decolonizing for just so we get this straight is an awesome cause. It's an awesome notion. It's a fantastic and, idea. It really is a wonderful idea. And it's not about kicking all the white people out of the out of Canada and the states. It's it's more not. about learning to live and protect the land and to stop the rape and corporatization of absolutely everything, which is more or less everything that 
we all stand for in a nutshell. It's why we, it's, it's why many of us went to Occupy. It's why many of us, uh, many people have joined Zeitgeist. It's why many of people join all these different movements. It's because we understand that we're supposed to be caretakers of our land. And, and I say that our land, it's because it's, it's all of our lands and we're not doing right by it. Exactly. And so now now we have who runs the country. We have a prime minister and we have our white government who decides whatever they want. And then we have the AFN who's kind of like oh, under our government. So then the natives don't even have equal say in what goes on, because if they did, we probably wouldn't have as much pollution and all kinds of other stuff. Um, so, yeah, the notion of decolonization. Excellent. Now, here's the issue, here's the experience that I had. The catch. So, There's always a catch. We have these fantastic ideas, and then we see who's behind them, and then the plot uh, thickens. Yes. Um, so, I got involved with decolonization because someone met me on Occupy and was telling me about it, and telling me about how, you know, she works with this, this woman uh, on Six Nations, and the woman is super smart and knows what she's doing and she's all got her hands on all this legal stuff and she's doing all this paperwork and she filed this thing against Harper and it sounded awesome and she was really convincing right she really you know she had the papers and she was very convincing like we know what we're doing we need help and you know you're smart and you work hard and so you should come with us because we need your help so I started talking to these people and um uh so I'm like trying, how am I going to say this with a punchline at the end? <laughs> <laughs> so fast forward two months. So anyways, I started working with them and we do the paper. We're working on researching and stuff like that. But as I'm working with them on the papers and researching and putting up a website and all this stuff that I'm, I'm doing for them, they are talking about this spiritual stuff. And, you know, one of them's telling me that she's psychic and I'm uh, open-minded at this point. And I'm like, okay. And, um, she does this healing on me and she started doing these healings on me all the time where she would like play this music and, and make me relax and blah, blah, blah. And then she'd start telling me all this stuff and about the woman she's working with. And anyways, I guess, in a nutshell, what happened was I thought I was going in to do this political stuff, papers, legal, whatever, and got to know that they were spiritual. Okay, that's cool. Getting to know stuff. Oh, she's psychic. Okay, that's cool, you know. New age and crazy then, wackadoos. But anyway, yeah, continue. Continue, yeah, but continue. Then, but then, and then there's like more people that, so anyways, this woman makes me, she's like, well, you need, you have to come here. You have to come here. I'm like, why? I have a computer here. I can work from here. No, no, no. You have to come here. You have to come stay here. You guys are going to come here. You're going to stay here for like six weeks. And you're going to sleep here. So I'm like, oh, okay. So I pack up all my stuff. I go to Six Nations. I stayed on the reserve for six weeks with her and learned a whole lot of weird <laughs> stuff. Now, just to, just to join in with you so you don't feel like you're all out there by yourself right now. I had met this woman who was heading the decolonize. Her name is Nicole. And I, I, I listened to what she was saying now because I've spent so much time um, with the, I don't want to say the sovereign movement or the, the free man movement, but that's what people recognize it as a lot of the time. So in that area, um, the, a lot of the legal papers that she was, you know, that I'd gotten a chance to take a look over <clears throat> were very reminiscent of a lot of the work that is being done within the other. So, I mean, I was very interested and I figured, you know, I'd call, I'd call up this woman. And, and so, and, and, and I was, I was jazzed about the idea myself. And it was in that phone call that she claimed, and she had sent me also, I have to, just to, cor uh, to, collab um, to corroborate your story. Um, she had sent me this, this healing. I was, I was privy right, to it. I right. never did it. I never did it. It was a YouTube, um, very, very long yes. Uh, meditation like an hour long or something like that and and I never did it for whatever reason and I usually do meditations when people send me them but this one I never did um anyway so we're talking and she says to me that she's the avatar of the creator and I'm like okay so because I have a bunch of weird little beliefs myself and I kind of think that we're all expressions of that one source 
um, in it's you know it in our version. This is my version of what you know creation wants to experience, or whatever the case may be. But sometimes my views change on on all that. But anyhow, <laughs> I don't claim to be the avatar of the creator, nor do I claim to have any type of um, say in what goes on here, other than that I'm the change that I want to see in the world, and I try and work at that every day. Whereas Nicole expressed that she's like the creator and destroyer of all worlds and things. And I was like, wow, sci-fi did damage to your brain. (laughs) I love sci-fi. She she told you early on because they like really inched their way into it with me. Like, and then when she first told me that it was already after they, you know, they weren't really specific. And then they tell me this. And first thing that comes to my mind, like at this point, I'm, I'm, I was very open minded about this spiritual stuff and psychic and all this, whatever. Now, not so much after my experience. I'm like door shut, closed. I don't want to know. <laughs> but she uh, first thing I'm like, how can you that's balls? You know, that's how can you say that you are the creator of all life? Like, how highly do you think of yourself that you can say that? But then she has the story that goes along with it and about, oh, no. We will no. get to that after the break. Yay, we did it this time. <laughs> Lifting the veil with Carrie Lee on AmericanFreedomRadio.com. American Freedom Radio. American Freedom Radio. Welcome back to American Freedom Radio. You're listening to Lifting the Veil. I'm your host, Carrie Lee. We're here live with Natasha Hines, author of Occult. Um, I have have a confession to make. I'm a little bit of a computer, not so smart one. And um, I don't know how to do the listener thing yet where you guys can call in. And I'll learn it before next week, I promise. And (laughs) I'll be more prepared. But right now I have uh, a friend on my list who wants to know um bradley says i wonder if your guest has any insights as to any agents getting in and infiltrating occupy like a friend of ours uh lawrence um mccurry Uh, can you can you say anything about any insights you might have as to the agents getting in and infiltrating well i have no actual evidence i mean it's pretty pretty obvious because they're not going to tell you but um, after all, everything that I heard from other people's experiences, they all kind of tied in together. It was it was kind of systematic about how there was the key committees. There were certain key committees that you know it all happened kind of the same thing in each occupy, where someone will come in and they would come out of nowhere and they would you know they don't come in at the beginning where they're trying to help you. They come in like a week in or two weeks in. They show up out of nowhere and then they get their hands real dirty and they get really involved and they take over the key committees like the financial, the the police liaison or whatever other committees that they can integrate into and um just basically get they they it's a strategy for how to take it apart from the inside. Like this is my theory, by the way, from what I experienced with certain people that the way that they behaved and the way that they sabotaged things and came out of nowhere and it was odd, um, the, how hard they tried to get me and certain other people out of those key committees so that they can replace us. Like going and bad mouthing us to the GA, like they really tried hard to get us kicked out of the, the committees that we started. That was messed up. And so it just seems very systematic. Many different occupies have the same different experiences. And so that's how they took us down from the inside. That is my theory. Awesome. Now, before the break, again, we were talking about our experience with uh, um, the decolonized situation. 
and we were talking about the idea that you know she had Nicole had brought you in and she was you were staying with her she was uh playing constant meditation music and then finally drop the old bomb that hey by the way i'm the creator of the world and i can destroy everything ha 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 right exactly when you put it that way just <laughs> <laughs> but she she had this story about how oh it was such a burden for her and she didn't want to know this and and she wishes she wasn't this and so you start go- feeling bad for her and you're like okay maybe she's not making up maybe what's going on here you start opening your mind to it and th- it's not just that it's the fact that she's like I didn't even know until these other people told me like and then it was like do I even believe it and oh these little kids these little kids from the reserve she says it wasn't little kids well, I finally figured out what happened afterwards. It was like a real exaggeration, let's say. So okay. all these these quote unquote psychic people were coming to her and telling her this. And and so it was other people telling her and oh, her son is the incarnation of Jesus Christ. Oy vey. Uh-huh. That's not narcissistic <laughs> I, at all. I missed that one, but okay, continue. <laughs> oh yes, oh yes. That was that was beautiful. She doesn't she doesn't stop talking about how amazing her son is and perfect. He's all perfect and he's the incarnation of Jesus Christ and people who see him if they're psychic if they could see on the other side well they just see all these bright lights and oh he's just magnificent looking on the other side and okay now I just want to tell the listeners quickly like I mean we're making light and jest of all of this and you might think that we're just being a bunch of catty little bitches (laughs) oh excuse my language but it's not about that it's the idea that you know we're living in this uh, society where great change is happening and (laughs) In the midst of all this great change that's happening, we have people that are that are creating fantastic ideas, and we have to really be watching the leaders of these ideas, and yeah. and who ha- who's the one be- the ones behind them? Because no matter how great the idea is, if you have somebody that's um, I don't want to say crazy, but well, but but that's that. Yeah, we'll just use that one for now because I don't want to use my brain any more than to say crazy. That's running it. it. You know, go ahead. Please do. It's narcissistic personality disorder. It's very high on the chart of a narcissistic personality disorder. Without getting into the whole, well, psychology is, you know, labeling and all this and that, because I could go on about that because, yes, I get it. But um, it's defined, defined as narcissistic personality disorder and a lot of cults, like real cults, okay, scary ass cults. I hope I could say that word. Sorry. Yeah, it's it's too late. I'll get reprimanded so, later. I apologize to everybody. We're gonna be in so much trouble. It's my fault. Anyway. It's gurus, gurus. So yes, so they are um, they are narcissists have narcissistic personality disorders. So they start off as these nice little um, charitable groups. These um, either charities or religious groups. You know, people who want to do good, and they get together. And there's a leader. It's not necessarily the person who comes up with the idea, but the person who definitely takes credit for the idea and gets everyone together. Is they the, they are the leader and. They tell other people the direction that they're going in. And so they have followers and these followers think that they're just doing good work and helping people and feeding the homeless and stuff like that. And what happens is you end up like months later in the situation, which you do not don't understand how you got into it. And you end up drinking the Kool-Aid and you end up uh, in a mass suicide in the middle of nowhere in South America or wherever it was. Um, Yeah, really. The Jones... uh, What's that guy called? The Jones something cult. Anyway, because that happens. And I didn't know that because if we don't know, you don't know. And it's so we think of cults as these weird, scary thing. And people in cults are just crazy and weird and dumb and they don't understand things. And they're incredibly brilliant. And then they go on this twisted path almost. Yeah. Well, it's Scientology. And you think that these people in Scientology and other cults are like just not like you they're just not like you and you would never end up in that situation and a lot of them are run by sociopaths psychopaths and which is something that's been spoken about on my show and uh i'm i'm vinnie's and others uh with thomas sheridan um psychopaths being like you know the there's the corporate psychopath and there's the the learned psychopath and there's the psychopath um it, it's all of these that are that are 
and end up running these types of things unfortunately the people that are most apt to be the leaders are are, are nine times out of ten charlatans yeah that's it and and i guess my point is that it could be you it could be anybody because it's not you don't it's subtle the way they get you in is subtle and they use a lot of techniques to that just reprogram beliefs in your mind and you don't know what's happening until you're in it and you're like what is going on and sometimes you catch it or some people who are aware they catch it and they're like "Mm -mm, uh -uh, i'm not joining scientology you're not getting me into that church but once you get in there it they it's another game because it's brainwashing it is brainwashing and uh, so, so how could, did things come about? How did things come about with Nicole when you finally, you know, clued in and went, "Oh no, what have I, what have I gotten myself into now?" Well, it took me a while because she ended up. It turned out she was surrounded by all these people who could allegedly see on the other side, and they all saw exactly the same thing. And so I'm like, "Well, that's wow." You know, like you guys all see the same thing. Yeah, it looked like this and it looks like that. And we could do that and blah, 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 blah. And uh, yes, she is the creator. And then, and then, you know, not everybody knows about this because we have to hide it. And then, and then, and so it took me a while to really realize what was going on because I was, I had been being indoctrinated a little bit at a time. And that meditation that you were talking about, your instincts are sharp because I did listen to it and I don't think I wanted to. I think I had the same instinct about not wanting to and I procrastinated a lot, right. but they kept they kept insisting that I do it. You have to do it. You, my gut was tur turning like I had butterflies in my stomach. I knew something was wrong and they kept telling me that it was because I was possessed by something kind of thing. And so I had to do the meditation to get rid of it kind of thing. That's the kind of mind games that they play with you and you'd think, in, in a different state of mind, in a clear head, you're like, well, that's ridiculous. I would never. <laughs> all, sure. Obviously, obviously they're crazy. But when they do it a little bit at a time, a little bit at a time, and they have other people around you. Telling and you're you all the same living thing, together. Yeah, it starts changing your beliefs. And you're, I was isolated because I was there for six weeks on the reserve. There's nothing there. No one to see except for other people that she's friends with. Exactly you know, how she wants you. Exactly. Completely isolated. They're playing the meditation all day, every day kind of thing. And constantly telling you all these stories, indoctrinating you constantly to the point where I, I believed it. I believed it. And that's when at some point I'm like, something's wrong. And I, as I was researching this book and I started figuring out what cults are about, and I was associating, you know, brainwashing techniques that were used in Occupy with the same things that she was doing. I started watching documentaries about cults and I realized narcissistic personality disorder, what it is, that a narcissistic personality disorder on the top of the chart can really believe that they are the creator of all life and they will be very convincing about it. And uh, other people do the same thing. They tell, they tell people that they're the incarnation of God. And I'm like, Oh, and then it was a process of deprogramming myself. Like I had to deprogram myself and other people don't have that luxury. Like they need people to go in and deprogram them if that ever happens. Yeah, definitely. It's a strong personality. It's because like, I mean, I've got caught up in some stuff too, not necessarily cult like, but I've got caught up by a narcissistic cult of personality type. And so I, I do understand that it, I mean, it takes a, a very strong person to realize that they're in it when they've gotten into it and then walk away. And then there's some people that just, they just don't have that switch. Not that that's, there's anything wrong with it. It's just the way it is. That's it. I was lucky because, well, I mean, partly because uh, I have a very strong internal skeptic, but also because I was researching the book, because I've, I've taken so much abuse in my life that I had some sort of a information base and I was looking for answers. And I found the answers because I was looking for them. No, yeah, definitely. Um, if, if that's what I found when I called uh, when I called Nicole, I was looking to see what her, you know, what was the cut of her jib kind of type thing, right? I wanted to understand where she was coming from, so I got it. I, I don't know. I just got the answer that I needed right away. Okay, she's nuts, and I don't want any part of that. And that's when I removed a lot of myself from 
a bunch of different people that I kind of saw the same, I want to say, aroma coming off of them, if that makes any sense, and started to trust myself a little more internally because I saw that a, there's a lot of people right now who really think that they're a heck of a lot more than they are. And it's not to say that we are not here for a purpose and that we're not all conduits of fantastic energy helping each other to get to that next level kind of type thing. But when we put ourselves up on a pedestal thinking that we've got it all figured out, and that we're claiming ownership of anything. I mean, we don't, you know, I, I may be a creator of things, a co-creator, whatever you want to call it, but I'm not, I own nothing. I don't own anything. You know what I mean? It's just something that I'm, I'm, I'm kind of helping to progress or, or walking through. I'm, I'm on a journey. Anybody who's sitting there and saying, I've got it figured all out, I go running to the hills with people like that because that you know I finally figured out that anybody who says I know nah, you don't know doesn't know yeah exactly we're constantly learning and we're constantly opening our eyes to things so if you think that you've got it all figured out then it's probably because you got your eyes closed and you're not learning anything yeah and the minute you say that you know you know it's almost like you stopped learning you exactly said it. yeah it's like it, I, I remember um somebody close to me saying you know i've learned all i need to learn i don't need to learn anymore and i felt this deep sadness for that person in that moment because if i ever sat back and said i've learned everything i i would be like waiting for the grim reaper to show up you know where is he come get me because yeah. obviously there's no more point left to this i uh i I, it's it's very disturbing and like the reason why I have Natasha on is to bring to point that we love to follow we love to be led and we really have to figure out what it is we're being led to because nine times out of ten we're being led for the right reasons but f by the wrong people and a lot of the time if you see 99% of the people out there doing it you'll find me not doing it. Um, a lot of us are like that now, where if you see the majority of the people doing something, you take a step back and you try and figure out why it is they're doing it in the first place. Because if that many people are doing it, I don't know, something fishy's going on. Yeah, exactly. And that whole being led by the wrong leader thing kind of brings me back to the whole protesting thing, how... If you, you know, if you want, if you want to see change, then make a plan and see it through. Don't just protest until your wrong leader leads you in a, di in a direction of some sort, because if they're the wrong leader, they're going to lead you in the wrong direction, no matter how much you protest. That's right. And and we're at the point now where we, I, I, I hope people understand. I, I love the fact that protesting spreads awareness and whatnot. And I see the value in it that way, but they're coddling us. And they're cattling us and they're and they're prodding us and they're spraying us and they're hurting us and what is that proving? I don't know. Just food for thought. Stay tuned. More of Lifting the Veil on American Freedom Radio coming up. Welcome back to American Freedom Radio. You're listening to Lifting the Veil. This is Carrie Lee, and I am losing my voice, people. <laughs> We're live with Natasha Hines, again, author of Occult. We're on our way to wrapping up the show, and uh, I'd like to thank Natasha so much. Sweetheart, it's been an absolute honor having you as my first guest of the show. Uh, what do you want to say t as far as like to as a conclusion to your Occupy cult situation and I, and a, not a, a, apart from the Occupy book, but the you know the cult of Occupy and the cult of um, the decolonize and just what that kind of shows in a in a micro macro sense. What's the message that you want to get out there to people? Um, I just, I think we've touched on everything already. Just question everything. You know, uh, don't rely on leaders. Don't rely on, on complaining until somebody else does something. Do it yourself. Get a plan. Do it. Do as much research as possible. YouTube is free, man. Just do it up. 
and there is hope there there's lots of hope and things will change this is not meant to be pessimistic at all this is not meant to you know discourage people that in a sense that we have the power to change things we absolutely do and things are changing and they're just changing because people are making the changes happen and Everybody can be part of that. Everybody can just decide that they want to be a part of that change and make something happen. Small, big, doesn't matter. It all is just as important. And everybody is, has that ability to make, to be extremely valuable to the change that we need in the world. So don't think that you're too small or you don't have the ability or you don't, you know, to have the power to do it or the talent to do it or the smarts to do it or, or whatever, because I hear so many people that are discouraged. It's not, that's your beliefs and you need to change them because you totally, anybody and everybody has that ability to make an, an, a change that's important in the world. Yeah, for sure. And now something um, a friend of mine who's listening to the show says, if groups like Occupy aren't helping and gurus aren't there, then what the heck is left? What do we need to bring together a community that's for humankind? And, you know, all I can say is that some of my my perspective is that you jump onto these Occupy situations and all these different movements and you try your hardest to make a difference within them by being the change you want to see. You can't exactly. control everybody and you can't go into these go into these movements with the right intentions not to destroy them but to make sure that whoever you can talk to and touch is going to understand that they're not there to be a follower. They're there to be change. That's what we're here for. We're here to be in service to each other as as mankind, as, as far as I'm concerned, my opinion, take it or leave it, it's totally up to you. But we're not here to, uh, to, to, to hurt and act dishonorably to people. We're not here to be adv- adversaries to our brothers and sisters. That's not what we're here for. So and, and what we have to be doing, and my thought is that you have to want to find people that are community-minded and gravitate towards them. It's happening in my life because it's what I put out there. You get what you put out. Uh, it, it comes back to you. I'm a living example of that. Um, but you have to work for it. There's nothing to be attained without a, a lot of work, sweat, tears, blood. You got to put your whole soul into it. You can't meditate for things to happen. Meditation helps to, that's it. to cure you. It's like, you know, that's your own therapy. Okay, fine. But like you don't meditate for peace and peace is just going to happen there's legwork that needs to be done. Exactly. It's like that, uh, that saying with the boat where this guy is stranded in the ocean on a boat. And so he prays to God to save him. Says, you know, dear God, please save me, save me. And he's praying so hard. And then the next day, uh, a little boat comes by and they're like, hey, you want to get in our boat? We can drive you to shore. And he's like, no, 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 no. I, God's going to get faith. me. Exactly. God's <laughs> going to save me. And so he keeps praying. The boat leaves, keeps praying. Another boat comes, a bigger boat. They offer him the same thing. Nope, nope, nope. God's going to save me. They leave. He does the same thing. Keeps praying, praying, praying. Third ship comes by. Come on, let's save you. Let's go to shore. No, God will save me. God will save me. And then he dies because he never got on a boat and he gets to heaven and he's like, I don't understand, God. What happened? I prayed so hard and you just never saved me. And God's like, I sent you three boats. Why did you not get on one? What did you think was going to happen? If you want to manifest my point, cut, there's a pause there. Okay. My point is if the manifesting thing is about believing in a change, you know, believing in, in a, in a vision and then You'll notice that things come into your life to help you accomplish that, help you acquire that. You don't just wait and close your eyes in your room and then the world magically changes. It's pieces of it will fall into your path and you have to do the work. Exactly what you said. Do the work and you will get it. Exactly. Exactly. Um, I can't I can't think of a better message to end the show with other than you know and I'm not saying I'm ending the show that's not what I'm saying at all but like be your be your own person stand side by side with your brothers and sisters you know work hard to get what you want make sure that you are 
I find so many people go like one way or the other. I'm going to be totally holistic and I'm going to love everybody and I'm not going to, you know, pay attention to what I have to pay attention to in the real world so that I can survive or I'm going to pay attention to all this legal stuff and 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 how to free myself but I'm not going to take care of my body or I'm going to be very, very, very intelligent, but I'm not going to know, you know, it's body, spirit, mind, you know, it's, it's, it's that trifecta of wholeness that we have to get in tune with, not to leave it on, you know, this philosophical, spiritual side of things, but in doing and putting all of these things that we're learning together and not being extreme one way or the other, that's where we're making our mistakes, guys. You know, we're extreme Christians, we're extreme um, truth conspirists. Uh, not that I, you know, conspiracy theorist, whatever. I, I, I'm, I, it's, I get that that's just a derogatory term. I'm just pulling it out of a hat. Um, extreme hippie, extreme. Well, if we just stop being so extreme. A friend of mine says, you know, when you're extreme, it doesn't leave you much room to move. Don't put yourself in a box. That's it. That's yeah. that's true. Stop trying to label yourself and then conforming your your the shades of your beliefs to conform to the label. That's right. And one last thing that I think is very important is it's not us versus them. We have to stop with this perception of it's the people versus those oppressing us or this us versus them thing. We're all one people and it's just that parts of the people or parts of society are sick. But if you have like a bum foot, are you going to chop it off or are you going to heal it? You know, you don't destroy or cut away the bad parts. You have to heal them and we're all one that needs to be fixed as one. That's right. That's exactly it. We uh, we all kind of, we're all interconnected. What affects one affects the other. My dog's barking in the background. I hope nobody's getting any of that. But uh, Natasha, thank you so much for coming on the show today. Um, thank you. I love you. Ah, I love you too. Thank you for being <laughs> a part of Lifting the Veil's premiere show on American Freedom Radio. Um, it was absolutely fantastic talking to you. As I said in, you know, in the breaks, it's nice to be able to talk about something with somebody who shares, you know, some of the same experiences that you do. It makes it a little less scary when you talk about it with somebody that, you know, sees it from your point, which isn't to say that we're ganging up on Occupy. We're gang. We're just saying we saw the little things that bothered us and we want to put it out there so maybe other people might see it. Yeah. For Open sure. your mind. Open That's your mind. That's right. That's right. All right. Thanks so much for joining us today. Next week on Lifting the Veil, same bat time, same bat station. Um, we welcome author, energy worker, visionary artist, and musician Martin W. Ball. His latest books, Being Human, An Entheological Guide to God. Ha ha, I said it. Evolution and the Fractal Energetic Nature of Reality in 2009 and the Entheological Paradigm Essays on the DMT and 5 Mio DMT Experience and the Meaning of It All are his most radical and hold the potential to dramatically alter humanity's understanding of itself and its place in the grand order of things. Visit Martin's website ahead of time to find out what he's all about at www.martinball.net. His book, Being Human, was gifted to me by my fantastic editor, Justin, and I suggest everybody get a copy and listen to it, uh, or <laughs> listen to, yeah, listen to me and read it. Um, keep that brain active. Uh, reading is a good thing. I'm not saying that you have to accept everything that you read, but just read form an opinion go your own way um again we just talked to natasha hines author of occult thank you so much for listening to me carrie lee on americanfreedomradio.com we'll see you next week peace